Top of the day to you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much for uh, watching yet another video from here. Today we will talk a little bit about shallops as type of craft and uh, specifically also for this by now becoming quite popular in the US kit of a shallop. The author of the sister channel very often asks me and this is where I truly upset her, uh, asks me a question about how was something done aboard Rio ships in the past and expects to get a straightforward single word answer. Yes, no, up, down, that's it. Every time I give her instead my favorite answer, well, it depends. Because in maritime things, everything does depend. And things change. The same word means different things. And vice versa, the same thing can be called different things. One of these uh, terms that change uh, meaning over the years and that can mean more than one thing actually is the word shallop. We have records of shallops from probably the 15th, 16th century for sure. And that continues all the way into the 18th century. Subsequently, they tend to disappear, mostly. So, what about shallops? What is a shallop? Again, I refer to my earlier statement. It depends who you ask and what you expect to receive as an answer. There are different kinds of shallops. They changed over the years. They're meaning their purpose changed. But in general, they were, uh, began life as vessels of uh, somewhat larger size, 26 feet on the keel or thereabouts. They tend to be initially and often they tend to be carried aboard ship in bits and pieces and reassembled once the vessels arrived in the New World. That is to say the Americas, the Western Hemisphere. Uh, they, in earlier versions of the vessel, they were used in the whaling industry, especially in the days when whaling was done from shore. Boats were sent out and brought the uh, catch to shore to be processed. So we see them in the Basque countries, we see them on the Basque whaling ship uh, from Red Bay. We see them in different contexts. By the 18th century, the shallop or the double shallop had changed into essentially a naval type of uh, boat, or rather I should say, a uh, type of vessel used for landing troops. Such a double shallop was discovered in the Dnipro River by my colleagues from the Zaporizhia Archaeological uh, Reserve, specifically Dr. Dmitry Kubalia and his colleagues. Returning to the specific motto and uh, well, rather the kit. It is named uh, Captain Smith's, John Smith's uh, shallop, but of course this is uh, just part of the marketing skills. It is likely to represent a shallop that may have looked something similar to the type of vessel that Smith would have seen and used in the early years of the Virginia colony. We do not have any drawings of shallops from this period. We have, uh, that is to say, technical drawings. We do have some specifications. We do have some contracts, some descriptions, especially in court cases. Yay for human love of sewing, uh, suing each other. That has provided us with fantastic records for many things. But uh, we have also some uh, rough sketches, portraits on charts, on in logbooks, etc. But we do not have technical drawings, partially because people really did not need uh, te detailed technical drawings to build shallops at the time. All they needed were the modes, the approximate dimensions of the vessel, and that was all that they required to put them together. So how do you describe a shallop? Mm, excellent question. Uh, Captain Smith himself described them as medium-sized boats, somewhere between the skiff and the longboat on a ship. We know that some shallops could have a small cuddy in the bow or in the central part or in the stern. They became quite popular in the New World, in uh, Maryland, in Virginia, in New England actually. Uh, one of the earliest references we have for shallops is about one brought on Mayflower. Bradford describes it. Bradford uh, mentions quite a few shallops, actually, 
around the Plymouth uh, plantation. And uh, they're fairly flat bottomed. As I said, they different dimensions, but uh, most of the references that we have seem to put their dimensions between 23 and 27 feet on the keel. They, generally speaking, were open boats, with the few exceptions when cuddies were added uh, in the bow or in the stern area. They normally had a crew or a minimum uh, crew of four to five, six men at the most, but obviously could carry a lot more. Fairly beamy, fairly shallow drafted, at around three, three and a half feet depth inside the boat. They were very good at transferring cargo to ships, and vice versa, obviously, from ships to dry land. They were particularly popular in the tobacco growing countries for transferring the crop to the ships. There are references for uh, them being used also in fishing, particularly on the New England coast. Bradford specifically says that the shallop that was brought across on Mayflower and was subsequently repaired, it took them about 16 days to put her back together since she came in bits and pieces. That vessel was extensively used for fishing as the colony was suffering from shortages of food. The next interesting question to address, of course, is the rig of the vessels. We have references in the records for masts, for spritzels, for sails and for oars, of course. It, uh, because of the mentioning of spritzel in some of the original, particularly court uh, documents, the obvious conclusion is that they were fore and aft rigged. And this is how Pavel Nikitin has designed his kit with a spritzel that is possibly visible through the camera, but the spritzel over here, it ends the forward end is coming right behind the jib. In my humble opinion, it is coming a little bit too far forward because what happens when you're trying to tack the forso, as the English would have said, here in America we may actually call it jib or uh, staysail, but the proper name would have been forso back then. So what happens? How do you tack the sail over the sprit? I'll leave that task for you to figure out on your own. In this case, he has chosen to add lee boards. Most of the documents do not specifically mention them, but they are certainly possible for a shallow draft boat. They were popular. This may have been the Low Country's influence in this period. The other characteristic of the vessels is that they are double-enders. That is the one constant uh, throughout the history of the shallop. It is always some form of a double-ender. In this case, as you can see, both the bow and the stern are quite full, but in later periods they tend to uh, be uh, sharper. Also, boats that were used in the whaling industry also tended to be a little bit sharper in the bow and the stern area because of the ride for which uh, the sleigh ride that uh, the whale took them on. The bluff bows would uh, be problematic in that. This specific shallop, I believe, has way too many oars in comparison with uh, what we know from the records that normally four to six people. Uh, were used. I mentioned the cuddies. They could actually have bulkheads both in the bow and the stern because there are references, instructions uh, for trading with uh, Indians or Native Americans on the big rivers, uh, both on the Connecticut River and down in the south on what would eventually become the James River or be known as the James River. Uh, they were intended to exchange cargoes with the Native Americans, with only two of the six main crew uh, showing and uh, interacting with the natives, while the other four would be hidden in the bow and the stern cuddy with loaded guns. Just in case things went bad, they could easily clear uh, the central part of the boat through crossfire. The boats were reasonably maneuverable, that is why they were so extensively used for um, exploration on the rivers. They were fairly cheap to build. We have some references to prices, uh, both in tobacco and in actual currency. 
it appears that the cost could be anywhere from about two pounds to four or five pounds fully equipped. They had grapnel type uh, anchors and normally the builder was supposed to provide them with the sails, with the rig, the oars and with the uh, anchor cable and the grapnel type of anchor. This is how uh, Pavel Nikitin has presented his kit. It is with the grapnel type of anchor. I am sure that the sister channel is going to discuss the quality of the kit in more detail. But here is a reference to it above my shoulder. And uh, I will only mention that the kit seems to be quite reasonable in its detail. I'm not sure what was the inspiration for this boat. Uh, there are some vague statements along the lines that research was done, I believe, in Germany by a friend of Mr. Nikitin's who did the research. I do wonder what sort of source material he used for that research. A uh, boat similar to the Shalap, of course, is well known from Vasa. When she sang right under her quarter was found subsequently her longboat. I doubt it was called Shala, but generally the type seems to be very close to what Mr. Nikitin has produced as a kit, except that the Vasa boat is flat bottom. Likely she was a terrible sailor, she's about 11 meters overall length, quite substantial, but much bigger than most of the shallops, who appear to have generally been less than 30 feet in length. But the overall clinker sides, the rounded bow, the round stern, the lee boards, the rig and the oars, all of these are common features. And I think that with this one, we can claim to have just about covered all that is known of uh, shallops. There are only two things that I would like to add before we close this uh, recording. A version of the shallop continued to exist. It is known as the double shallop or uh, double shallop. It was known also on the coast of the Bay of Biscay. Uh, generally speaking, uh, not a very pleasant water for pleasure cruising, shall we say. They must have been quite seaworthy, quite maneuverable. They were known as double shallops because they carried two masted rig. And this is where it becomes really interesting because a double shallop could have two different types of rig. The traditional Western European double shallop, for example, was with square sails. This is really the origin of the later brigs, clouds, and also of the brigantine. They tended to have long, that is say, tall and fairly narrow mainsail, the same but more squarish on the foresail. They were quite good at going against the wind, Contrary to what most people would think about square sails, they were very uh, effective in this configuration. Another version of that rig would simply have been with two masts, both of them rigged with spritzels. With this, I think we have covered all that can usefully be said in such a short video about shallops. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you ever so much for watching, subscribing, and returning to this channel. I will do my best to answer comments and questions that you may have. And with this, I wish you a most wonderful rest of the day. See you soon.